Hello, welcome to Insignia Investments. I'm very sure you've often thought of this idea. Let's buy a house or let's buy a piece of land because that is probably the most dominating form of investment advice we have received not only from our parents but also from our grandparents. And it's for some reason, right? There are logical reasons why investment in land or purchasing a house or purchasing an apartment is a great form of investment. However, I think there is a certain threshold under which purchasing a house or a piece of land is a great investment advice. But above the threshold, I do not believe that purchasing a land or investing all your money into a house or an apartment is good advice. It is a little counterintuitive, but let me elaborate. So if this is your first time on the channel, my name is Rupratin Dotto and I usually discuss things in and around finance, especially personal finance. I'm a corporate banker in terms of my profession and I'd like to shed some light on practical finance. Let's begin. So, houses. Houses are probably one of the largest investment that we as individuals or our parents as individuals have made in their or in our lives. It is the building block from which everything starts. A house provides you shelter, protection from where you pursue your hobbies, your education and all other activities in life. And it's a quintessential investment. That I agree and I admit right at the beginning of the video. However, if you already have a house that you have inherited or purchased, beyond that point, the reason to invest in housing or land becomes a little questionable. Let me begin with this uh, piece of article that came out on Mint, which says, the global housing market is broken and is dividing entire countries. Now, the link to this uh, article is provided in the description box below. But what it says is, all countries across the world, be it Singapore, be it China, be it Argentina, be it India, all these countries have a very broken system when it comes to housing. Now, what does it mean when I say broken? It means that the price that you have to pay for owning a house is so large, it's so high, that it no longer makes sense to purchase houses. So people who have already purchased houses, they are probably reaping some amount of benefit because they are getting rentals. On the other hand, the people who are just joining the workforce, people in their 30s or in their 20s, these people are seeing their dreams of purchasing their own house, like their parents, evaporating. Now, this becomes a little more dire when you come to India. So, I'm taking the reference from this book, Coffee Can Investing by Saurabh Mukherjee. Uh, a review of this will come through in a few weeks. However, uh, there's a ch chapter dedicated here which discusses the rent that people get for purchasing houses in India. So suppose you buy a house somewhere in Bombay. The average yield that you get in India is as low as 2.4%. That is, if you buy a house of, let's say, 1 crore rupees, right? So you, on an average, you'll just get 2.5 lakh rupees per year as rentals. 1 crore rupees house, 2.5 lakh rupees of rental every year. So you will need at least like 40 years to just recover this money back, right? So you put in money somewhere, the property rates either go up or your rentals increase substantially to make up for the money that you've invested as an investment. However, if you com contrast that to countries like Canada, where it's high as 4%, Indonesia 8.6%, you would start realizing that, you know, India really has low rental yields, very low rental yields. You can probably get one crore, two crore, houses for as low as, let's say, 60,000, 70,000 a month across various cities in India. On the other hand, the contrast which makes this situation even more dire is the fact that the affordability of housing in India divided by the per capita GDP. So in simpler terms, it means the price of a house divided by the on an average earnings that people make is one of the highest in the world. So if a person is earning 1000 rupees in India, his ability to afford a house is probably half of that a person who is earning 1000 rupees equivalent in their currency, let's say in Canada, and still be able to purchase that house. The ability just decreases to like 
nearly 10 times if you just move from a country like United Kingdom to India. So just to put some figures into perspective in this chart, the affordability measured by price divided by square meter as a multiple of GDP per capita is 610 for India, whereas that is like 15 for Germany, 42 for Japan and 72 for United Kingdom. So not only do you have low rental yields, the pricing in terms of what you earn is also so skewed. So not only you have lower affordability, but you also have lower earnings from that investment. So if you have lower earnings and your affordability is lower, in what universe can this be justified as an investment? Yes, that universe is when you are a person who does not own a house. If you're living on rent for all your life, let's say I know families who have lived on rent for all their lives, like their parents did not ever have the chance to afford a house. For those families, purchasing a house is quintessential and for them it's a good investment because their life depends on it. On the other hand, for people who have inherited property or they already have property, investing in real estate is a really stupid choice. Now, let me elaborate on this points a little further beyond what Saurav Mukherjee has done. See, the value of land is derived not on, only from the fact that people can live on it, but you can make productivity out of it. So let's say you take a parcel of land, you build a factory on it, right? You can employ 10 people there and you can make productivity happen there and so on and so forth. This model has kind of scaled up today. So earlier, like 10 people were living on one floor because they were not multi-story houses in India. Let's talk about say 1920s, 1930s. Today, even tier three, tier four cities have like four story buildings at every nook and corner. So like there are 40 people now living on the same piece of land. Going further down the line, if you have traveled to cities like Hong Kong or let's say Shanghai, you would have seen, or even Tokyo, like there are like huge skyscrapers, right? So number of people increases manifold. What problem that creates is while the property prices have increased, you're not getting new land, right? So when this building loses its life, let's say you bought a house whose expected life is 60 years. 60 years later, when this house does not have life left anymore, you cannot rebuild it, you cannot repair it, you'll have to break the entire building down and reconstruct it. What value will you get out of that land? Because it's going to be divided among, let's say, 100 people at that point of time, instead of just the 40 that is today, or just the five people 40 years or 50 years ago. So in that format as well, because of the population burden, that is also diminishing. The third crucial point here is the concentration of growth that we have in this country. There are majorly six to seven major cities in India. Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta, Madras, Hyderabad, Bangalore. What else? So you see, what I'm trying to hit here is there are not many major centers of development across India. There are certain cities which are really, really developed and then huge gaps in between which are not even developed. So if you're a person who's looking to invest your money in these markets, waiting for them to develop and then give your return back, you can only do it when you have substantial amount of fund and you're not a, the first generation of investor in your family. So if you're a person much like me, the first generation investor, you do not have a lot of capital. You want it to grow safely, securely through instruments that are more transparent, easy to monitor. Land is never easy to monitor. Encroachment is a problem. The fake documents are problems. You also run into problems of, you know, inheritance. There are multiple things that can get into the way. So simple things simply, if you require a house, buy it. If you don't, stick to normal forms of investment which are much more cleaner mutual funds uh, other forms of uh, saving schemes uh, fds any of the other formats but housing only and only when either you have too much money or you do not have any money and need a place to live under these two circumstances i believe housing makes sense else given the present scenario in india the system's abruptly broken that's all from my side there's an affiliate link in the description box below to purchase this book. It helps support the channel. If you like this content, do give it a like, do share it and stick around. I'm coming up with far more new innovative understandings of personal finance. See you in the next one.